All right. Hey, everyone. Uh, thank you for tuning in. This is a Valenta Insights, um, Insider Insights, Season 2, Episode 4. Oh, you got to turn off the <laughs> on, on this end. And uh, we have with here Nathan Morris, who is a managing partner with Valenta. He's also the head of analytics here at Valenta. Um, so Nathan's background is he he's has a rich background in, in, in ERP, right? So that's enterprise resource planning and data analytics. Um, working at uh, well-known companies, like, like he was with Baker Tilly, uh, which is, is a big uh, management consulting firm. And uh, yeah, so I'm excited to, to bring Nathan on to uh, discuss a little bit more about analytics. And, um, you know, he has a, a rich background in delivering, you know, work, working for some pretty large known companies out there. Uh, welcome, Nathan. Yeah, thanks, Davidson. Thanks for having me on here. Um, so yeah, just a little bit about my background uh, to further add what Davidson mentioned. Um, you know, worked with Baker Tilly for several years. Uh, came from predominantly a manufacturing background, but was able to apply um, a lot of the different data components that we worked with in, in manufacturing to um, initiate the, the data analytic practice within Valenta. Um, so we've been operating for about uh, a little over, or coming up on two years now. Um, and uh, we work with a wide variety of different industries, um, a wide variety of different software um, and systems and platforms. And so we're, we're really agnostic when it comes to who and, and how um, and where the solutions that we work in. Um, so we, we we work with several different solutions um, and it really depends on the nature of, of what um, you know you as a company, um, are currently working with already or you know what what infrastructure that you're looking for um, you know for the future and so um, you know when we're starting from ground zero you know we have a certain recommendations depending on the size and nature of the business um, and a lot of the key questions to come down to you know what data are you looking to consume how often you're looking to consume it and you know who are the users who are the end users that are looking to consume this data um, with the answer to those questions, you know, we're able to kind of pinpoint and help you to choose, um, you know, what data warehouse, what data infrastructure um, would best allow to support that, um, as well as, you know, who, um, what the visualization tool. Um, so there's a lot of different options in the marketplace. It could be quite overwhelming to choose, you know, which platform that you want to go with. Um, but we, you know, with our expertise and experience, um, will help align, you know, the, the right fit platform or platforms, um, depending on, on the need of your business. Yeah. So, so it sounds like, you know, like you said, there's so many vendors out there. So part of the value that you could pro pro provide to potential customers is even like going through that process, right. Depending how early you're on. And, and it sounds like you also work with, uh, for anywhere from mid market to really large enterprises, multi billion dollar companies as well, right? Yeah, 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 absolutely. Um, and so, you know, for the larger, more established organizations, you know, there's typically an existing infrastructure that, ex um, you know, the organization is currently operating in. Um, and so, you know, we deploy um, our data engineers, our analysts, um, scientists to. Uh, assist you know those company companies and corporations to um, help propel and excel their data journey. Um, whereas for the the smaller companies, um, you know we help to to build the initial framework, build the initial infrastructure, um, and we have the capability of, of actually in building that infrastructure on our platform and our um, existing Valenta infrastructure. Or, you know, we could, we could work with you to choose a, a platform of your choice. Um, you know, some, some of the ones that we typically work with are, are Azure. So Azure Data Factory, uh, Synapse. Um, and then, of course, the visualization tool for Microsoft is, um, is powered um, with Domo, um, which is really an all-in um, data solution that includes the extract, transform, load component, which, which allows you to really transform all your data that's coming in from the back end. Um, and then it has the visualizations similar to Power BI, Tableau, uh, Zoho Analytics, and some of the other ones. Yeah, yeah I think, uh, sorry about that. I had a little bit of a mic issue. Um, 
Yeah, yeah, Nathan, and and you worked with it seems like a lot of huge manufacturing companies as well. Um, you know, and, and there there's a lot of um, you know, for, for those of you who have joined earlier with Mark, you know, mentioned some some of those, but um, and it sounds like we we have a partnership with Rockwell Rockwell Automation. Can you share a little bit more about some of the practical use cases around that? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So uh, Rockwell is. Uh, is a large, uh, very large OT uh, hardware provider um, within within the manufacturing space, um, and uh, they recently purchased a, a ERP company called Plex, um, and that that's a lot of what my back background resides is you know helping manufacturers to you know, transform their business using using software, um, and so the Rockwell has done a great job with bridging the gap between software. And, and industrial hardware on the shop floor. Um, and and they, they came up with a solution and Mark mentioned on the previous session uh, called Data Mosaic, which operates on Cognite. Um, and, and what Data Mosaic is, is an industrial data ops solution. Um, so it allows you to connect the lineage and, and, uh, and all the different data points across your, your manufacturing plant um, and, and being able to connect them all um, to essentially create data models automatically using AI. So there's an AI technology that's that's beneath the hood. And what it's doing is it's looking for like and matches within certain data sets. And so let's just say that you have a time series data set um, on a particular um, like temperature reading. And that time series data set references a certain machine. And so it's able to using data mosaic is able to connect that time series data set to that machine just based on that AI logic that sits in the background. So it's, it's looking for like connections between different data sets and then I'll go ahead and match them. And then therefore you're able to automate the connection and then be able to use that connection in all the other, you know, data visualization activity that you, that you use downstream. And so um, you know, some of, some of the very prototypical use cases for data mosaic and manufacturing would be like enterprise OEE, um, OEEs, you know, operational efficiencies. Um, so trying to determine, you know, where there's potential, um, you know, bottlenecks within within certain processes, within, within certain lines. Um, and so a, a big pain point for manufacturers is a lot of times, um, you know, you kind of understand where issues are happening, but you can't articulate those issues. You can't articulate, you know, the extent of the issue and what it's causing. Uh, additionally, it, a lot of manufacturers struggle with being able to compare data points across multiple production lines, but more importantly, across multiple facilities, right? Um, and with an enterprise OEE or enterprise production monitoring capability, you're able to, to really roll up, drill down, drill down, or drill up, drill down based on the, the data points and the connections that are made and and uh, integrated through data mosaic. Hmm. So so, um, what I'm hearing is um, with with a lot of these tools, you're able to get you're able to leverage AI so that you're able to predict failure, or you're able to see if there's any discrepancies or anything that's falling different from the mean, and then with that, you're able to triage and instead of being reactive, you're able to be more proactive, right? In terms of resolving potential issues that might come up. Exactly, exactly, yep. And that, that, that's that's another application of um, a data mosaic model is, you know, getting into predictive uh, capabilities, right? And, and being able to leverage that enterprise data set to do preventative maintenance. Preventative maintenance is a really hot use case that's, that's in the realm of manufacturing right now where you're able to you know, forecast you know, when machines are, are going to go down and, and uh, you know, be able to do just-in-time maintenance versus a periodic monthly maintenance, um, which, which ultimately saves, you know, the manufacturer a tremendous amount of dollars, not only in downtime costs, but also the inventory that's required in order to make sure that you're, you know, have enough uh, spare parts to do that maintenance. Um, and there's, uh, there's other use cases such as uh, batch analytics. And so, you know, there's a concept of the golden batch. This is primarily for, for food and bev and, and, uh, and, and chemical, like chemical process manufacturing. 
Um, but, you know, we're essentially taking what is called golden batch. Um, and so the, you know, the most efficient uh, time to, to do that production on that particular line. And then you know, once you solidify what that golden batch is using the analytics, then you can really understand all the deviations that come in um, on, on running different other batches, right? And you could really understand, okay, this batch took a lot longer and it took longer because this machine wasn't operating at full capacity. I mean, it sounds like obviously there's a lot of implications for manufacturing, but what I'm hearing is you can also leverage this for other industries as well, right? Absolutely. Yeah. And so, you know, I look, I look at data mosaic um, as, as a very comparable tool to, to Databricks. Uh, so Databricks is, is a very hot tool um, in the analytic marketplace today. And there, there's, a, there's a tremendous amount of power to that tool. Um, and so one of the, one of the core components to analytics is, is data governance, data security, and also like understanding data usage. And so Databricks is, is, a, is a tremendous tool uh, that also has, you know, AI capability in the background uh, that allows you to take many different data sources. Um, so you, you could take a SQL Server environment, you could take um, a Snowflake environment, you could take, uh, you know, a, a lot of different connected sources and then be able to, to really put together um, a catalog of so a data inventory of all those different data points, um, and then you're able to actually control and grant and deny permissions directly within Databricks across all those different data sources. Additionally, you're able to see the lineage of, of all the data sources and any transformation effort. So, like if there's a, a function that's applied to a table, you're able to actually track that function directly within Databricks. And so, you know, this this is particularly important. It's, it's, it's always been a, very, very important, you know, as as a as a business to make sure that your data um, is governed properly, so that there's data quality um, concerns that are that are fully mapped out and whatnot. But this is becoming increasingly important for the next phase of of uh, of analytics. And so one of the one of the hot topics today is is using a generative AI on top of your data. Um, and this is a concept called self-served analytics. And so in order to be able to get to using generative AI, such as Copilot for Microsoft Power BI, um, you need to make sure that you have a really nice data models that sit down underneath the hood. And you need to make sure that there's, there's very defined data governance that defines the data that you're actually going to be exploring. And so, I mean, you don't want to get into a state where, um, you know, let's just say sales representative uh, X, Y, Z um, is, is, is asking a question about the data. And then all of a sudden they're getting data on, on financials, right? And, mm -hmm. you know, in reality, they, they, that, that user, that resource should have been restricted to actually being able to see that mm -hmm. finance data. And so, you know, having a very controlled data governance model Will, will prevent, you know, that type of activity from occurring. Hmm. So it sounds like because AI is obviously going to work off of really, like if you have good data, then AI will actually do its job. But there, there's a lot of um, companies that um, haven't put as much thought into the, the data governance side, right? Especially at the smaller organization, right? It sounds like this is enterprises are obviously thinking about it. Are you are you seeing that even in, in the enterprise space, there's still a lot of work to be done because AI is relatively new? Oh yeah, absolutely. Um, and so, you know, a lot of what we're seeing is that you kind of you more or less have to reroute and and redesign your data infrastructure um, because of AI. And so, mm. uh, a lot of times, if, if you would go in and, and just say, "I want to subscribe to Microsoft Fabric." And I want to I want to be able to see you know Copilot in action tomorrow. You could do that. You could go to Microsoft as your or you know go to your MSP and say, hey, I want Fabric. Turn it on. You get access to Copilot within Power BI. You can start ask, asking questions. But I guarantee the answers to those questions without any work to the data model and the data sets underneath will be inaccurate. And so so that's that's the key. Here is, is making sure that your data models and your data governance 
is is tight and controlled so that when a user is asking a questions in generative AI, such as Copilot, that the responses to that are going to be accurate and, and they're, they're vetted out and controlled, right? Yeah, so it sounds like because um, I like the example you said about a salesperson getting data on financials. Are you seeing that a lot of organizations like are struggling with with some of those um, with or is that you're just using an example that there just could be more thoughtful more thought put into some of these like data governance and strategy data strategies. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so um, I would I would certainly say I'm I'm gonna look at I'm gonna answer the question without AI and then I'm gonna answer it with AI. Um, so without AI, you know, data governance is typically an afterthought when in reality it should be a forethought, forethought in your data journey. And so a lot of times it's naturally, especially with the smaller to medium sized organizations, um, you know, we have an end user that stands up and says, Hey, I need access to this data in this manner, ASAP. You know, there's a typically, um, a, a very common use cases in finance where, or accounting where, you know, you need access to your 1099 data for the last year uh, because, you know, you need to be able to submit a tax return or you need access to um, your customer sales data over the last 12 months uh, because you need to prepare a presentation for your CFO. So um, it always starts with like ad hoc requests and then it kind of just grows and grows and grows and, and gets to a point where you, you start to take a step back and ask like, how did we get to this point, right? Um, and so, you know, a key with doing centralized enterprise data analytics is really to start with the infrastructure and the governance up front. So you don't get into that um, point where you've done all this development and it's, it's quote unquote uncontrolled. And so, you know, the the key um, with, with any type of data analytics analytic engagement is making sure that everything is controlled up front and that's controlled by by elaborate data infrastructures and elaborate data governance models as well as you know data catalogs um, and making sure that there's proper inventory of all your data points hmm. and then as as for answering the question on the ai um you know, for generative ai honestly Microsoft Copilot, they 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 marketed it as still in the beta mode. Um, it, it was just released about a year ago, and so, um, you know, a lot of the even larger corporations are still just in the exploration mode. So, um, they're they're turning it on just to give analytic or data analysts internally access to be able to explore it, uh, but they're not necessarily turning it turning it on quite yet for the end users. Um, and so I, I haven't come across an organization yet to my knowledge that is essentially allowing every single, you know, end user within their business or even the core end users of their business access to generative AI on all their existing data. So as of right now, you know, the way, where we are in terms of the self-serve AI component to data, um, from an end user perspective is, is really just prepping the, the framework and the infrastructure to support it in the future and then also testing the modeling and doing the exploration. Yes, it sounds like still pretty early stages. I know that we partner pretty closely with Domo. Would you want to share a little bit why you're so excited about Domo and why you, do you think that is a good um, provider in the data visualization space? Yeah, 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 absolutely. Um, so yeah, uh, first and foremost, uh, data, data, um, sorry, Domo is, is much more than just data visualization. So that's actually um, the number one value add um, and benefit of, of working on Domo is that you get access to everything. And so, you know, when, when you go to um, AWS or when you go to Google or when you go to Microsoft, um, usually you typically have to uh, buy, subscribe to a, a platform for your data warehouse, uh, subscribe to your platform for your ETL services. Um, such as, uh, you know, in, in AWS, you have to do Lambda or you know, for Microsoft, you, you have to do uh, Azure Data Factory or Synapse um, or even, you know, Windows Task Schedulers. Um, and then last but not least, there's a, the visualization component. So usually there's three core software uh, 
platforms that are involved for all the major vendors out there on the marketplace. Whereas Domo, they, they bundled all that together into just one platform. And so you get access, access to all those different components. So your data warehouse, your ETL components, you know, how you're building that data pipeline, um, as well as the visualization all within one package. Um, additionally, the majority of the other um, you know, market leaders, such as Power BI, uh, Tableau, um, and, uh, and even you know, getting into like your Snowflake and, and the other data visualization tools, um, a lot of it is, is pricing model is based on a per user consumption, um, whereas Domo is actually it's priced out per credit. And so a credit is you know how, how many data objects are you loading into a data warehouse, um, how many uh, magic ETL is their proprietary name for um, you know how they're doing their data pipelines. Um, that's essentially one credit. And so, you know, if, if you're not a huge consumer of data, meaning that you only maybe have your data coming in, you know, once a week or, or once every other day, um, and you're not having to run it every single second of every day, um, then Domo might be a good fit in the sense that their pricing is done on a consumption based model versus a per user model. And so, you know, if you have a lot of users that you want access to uh, a lot of different analytic apps and you don't have that much data coming in in terms of consumption, then Domo is a great fit for the organization in the sense that you're not paying for each and every single user within the platform. Not, not to mention they have a lot of fantastic advanced functionality out there that's compar comparable to Power BI and other platforms. It sounds like one of the advantages of leveraging a consulting partner like yourself, right, and, and us at Valenta is just because we have exposure to so many different technologies and then um, the being able to be vendor technology agnostic as well. And you're able to, um, depending on the, the, the case study and what's going on, the use cases, right, you're able to make recommendations based on that, right? Yeah, 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 absolutely. And uh I mean, it's not it's not just uh, you know myself and the other managing partners. Uh, a lot of times, it's coming from uh, our team members. You know, we have a wide variety of team members, which includes you know data engineers, analysts, um, as well as scientists. Um, we even uh, you know we usually even have a couple of full stack developers on our team as well uh, to create you know spin off applications uh, within our data. And so you know, based on those four unique positions. Um, we're pulling from a, a wide array of, of expertise and uh, and process knowledge, you know, and, and they really bring a lot to the table. So that segues nicely into what made you decide to join Valenta over all the other managing consulting uh, companies out there? Yeah, you know, I, I think Valenta is, is positioned nicely to really target, you know, the small to medium businesses uh, that, you know, maybe perhaps can't get access or can't don't have the budget for these type of solutions. And so, you know, using uh, Valenta's offshore uh, model, um, operational model, um, we're really able to to present these these solutions and proposals to our clients, the small to medium sized clients um, at, at a relatively affordable economic price. Um, that allows us to to get started and, and, and start working with the, those uh, small and medium businesses. Uh, that that's one of the primary reason. Um, you know, additional reasons is is that you know it's a newer and, and expanding organization, um, and so you know we have we have an opportunity to to make some uh, very transformational changes across the board, um, and so we're not we're not. Um, essentially isolated to one or a few different technology solutions. Um, really, you know, we, we have the option to work with many technology solutions. We label ourselves as technology agnostic, which at the end of the day is what we are uh, because of our capability to work with, with any and every technology. Hmm. And I feel like you're one of the OGs, uh, I guess you can call it OGs, um, at Valenta, so you've probably seen a lot of changes uh, at Valenta. Like, how have you seen the evolution of Valenta? You know, throughout your time, like, there's a lot of new people, a lot of different partners that, you know, and going to Bangalore, I'm sure you're exposed to 
a lot more. We just share a little bit about some of the exciting things coming up, either coming up the um, it, uh, launches soon or just some of the evolution of Alenta as an organization. Yeah, yeah, yeah absolutely. Um, now, I would say that the biggest evolution of Valenta is really the, the project management methodologies. Um, and, you know, we, we've gone from, um, you know, just managing the projects, you know, from an isolated perspective, um, you know, individual managers that are working on a couple of different projects and they're not you know, reporting to any overall structure to now we have very defined structures and methodologies in place uh, to manage projects across the board. Um, and uh, our, our clients really value that. Um, you know, that's that's one of the the plus that we typically hear uh, from, from each of our clients is, hey, you guys have great project management. Um, I really like how organized and structured this is. Um, one one common uh, comment that we receive is, um, I thought I was going to be much more involved, but you know, I'm, I'm taking a very hands-off approach to this project, and and that really is contested to you know organizational changes um, and evolutions at Valenta in the sense that you know project management is not is not just something that um, it needs to be done. It's 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 really innate to you know, what we're doing and and the delivery model that we're providing. Hmm. Yeah. So, and so, and, um, so, so you've taken on the, the head of analytics practice. So you've seen that grown pretty tremendously here too, right? At Revalenta. Um, what made you want to step into that role? Um, like what, what was that market need that you saw that, you know, I'm sure there's a lot of clients where you saw their faces light up when you showed them our capabilities. Um, can you share a little bit about how that Genesis started? Yeah, 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 absolutely. Um, you know, there, there's always a need for it. And the biggest need for data analytics really bundles down to um, you have very valuable key resources across the organization that are spending too much time to, to extract and to model different data. And by modeling, I'm saying very basic, just extracting you know, one data source from this system well, you know, one Excel file from this system, one Excel file from the other system, and then combining it into like a, a consolidated Excel file. And it could even be like, you know, you a resource pulling data from one system and just another module within the same system, and then having to do some manipulation. Um, and, and people, even to this day, I would say almost every single organization has this use case in which if someone is spending a couple minutes to hours a day on doing this data manipulation. Um, and so, you know, there's certainly a need for data analytics you know, at, across all majority, if not every organization, um, you know, in the world, um, in the sense that, like, hey, I need to be able to provide my end users data in their fingertips right when they walk, walk, walk in the door in, in the morning without having to do any extraction, without having to do any manipulation to the data. Um, and so that's, that's, the in my mind, the number one need for analytics is saving your your core team members, you know, the time it takes to manipulate and to produce the data that they're looking for day in and day out. Um, and, and that's that's an evolving need, um, especially in, in the sense that the, the software is getting better and better um, over time. And, you know, they have the ability to export data from essentially every single module within a lot of different core software, such as you know, SAP for ERPs, uh, Salesforce as it relates to CRM. Um, and I, I realized that a lot of the systems are you know, providing reporting capabilities. And so, you know, as Mark mentioned in the previous session, I always recommend to actually to start with looking at the reporting capabilities of that core software. Um, and a lot of times, you know, you just can't get what you precisely need from that core software, or you have to connect it to another software. And, the, and that's really the, the need for a centralized data warehouse. Hmm. So you're seeing there's a lot of, I mean, data obviously is not going anywhere. Every, like you said, every year is because there's more and more data sets. There's a lot of silos. And you're also seeing that, especially with Gen AI, right? It's like, okay, there's the next evolution of data, which is more of the self-serve service model, you said. Mm -hmm. how, how close 
are we as a society are you seeing to like a fully self-service model or do you think that's a few years out until we start seeing full adoption across the not only the enterprises but eventually the mid-market and um, smaller organizations as well yeah i mean it's, it's very close it's very close uh you know gen a ai is getting better and better um you know and it's 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 not about um i guess it, it depends on the organization right you know for the early adopters you put in a, a gen ai model and then it, it gets better and better right it trains on its own data and so mm -hmm. I, my my recommendation and my um, your message to the companies is, is get it started sooner versus later and, and put together, um, you know, some just some timelines in terms of, hey, we're going to start looking at generative AI in, in the fall of 2024. And and then, you know, here are the, the core steps that are needed in order to start to explore that. We need to take a look at our data catalog. You know, I recommend using products such as Databricks um, with, with their core product called Unity. Um, to start to inventory all your different data points. Um, so to validate your different data point, data quality is a huge factor. You make making sure your data is clean. Um, and, and Databricks and Unity, they, they do a great job in terms of using AI solutions um, to really to, to start to, to automatically pinpoint and validate your data. So one example of that, and this, 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 this is AI that exists today that's very practical for any organization is to use. And so one thing that like Unity and Databricks does is it'll actually go in and detect where there's anomalies within data points. And so let's just say that um, we have a field called first name. And the first name we're used to seeing Davison, Nathan, Mark, et cetera. And then all of a sudden, you know, we get someone that types in one, two, three, four, five, which is a number. And so Databricks through the data validation methodologies will automatically use an AI to detect that we have we have a, a row, a record that doesn't match all the others. And we didn't even have to apply those rules. Um, it just naturally does that based on the AI model underneath. And so, um, you know, those are all solutions that I recommend any business to have today. And that really allows you to get to the adoption of self-serve analytics and gen AI. Um, so to answer your question, um, you know, if, if you start today, you know, we, you could be looking at a, a a year to two year long period in, in, in order to release that functionality to like your sales representatives to, you know, production floor managers, et cetera. Um, but it really just starts by it, it really. The key is just getting started. Right. And, and perhaps just letting your data analysts, uh, your internal IT team to, to start to explore the solution. And then I always recommend that even if you are going to be releasing it to end users, don't necessarily release the the tool and the function to the end users, but more or less like have like an IT layer in between. And so like an end user could ask the question and then IT or data analyst would go in and key that, that question into the prompt. They get a response, validate the response, modify the response and then send it back to the user so it's like almost like a value add so use generative ai as a value add and an efficiency gain to your it and data departments versus versus mm -hmm. just initially releasing releasing it out to everyone that, that that's helpful um and i know you and i do a lot of um work with um like accounting firms C can you share a little bit about what we're doing with Atani and uh, how we're able to serve not only the accounting firms in terms of their audit and all that, but also in terms of their book of business as well, right? Eventually, once we, you know, build that use case internally as well. Yeah, 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 absolutely. So Atani is uh, another tool out there. Um, this kind of just go back to, goes back to my initial point that there's there's so many tools out there. Uh, but Atani, Atani is, is, is a great tool uh, for the accounting sector as a whole. And so, you know, what Atani does is it links your, your core accounting system, such as QuickBooks, such as Xero, such as Myobi, um, to other core systems across businesses, uh, such as ERP systems, such as CRMs, um, such as other, you know, core unique software that businesses use. And so what Atani allows for tax and audit managers 
to do is it, it allows them to become better advisors, right? It allows them to become a better advisor um, and, and be able to provo- provide reporting that that really is outside of the scope of your traditional reporting tools. And so one common complaint that, that accountants get is that, hey, I have access to this QuickBooks report, but I can't modify it. I can't tie in this data. Or I have access to Fathom. Fathom is a very prototypical financial reporting tool. Um, you know, I, I really like the fact that Fathom can do this, but I really want to do that. And so that's what Otani does is it's, it's all powered by Power BI. And it, it provides that initial template, that initial framework that yeah. mimics, if you will, the, the QuickBooks or Fathom reporting capabilities. But then it allows you to customize it, it allows you to tie in other data sources. It allows you to, to, to make your own visualizations. And so it, it really allows, you know, these accounting firms uh, to take their reporting and their advisory side of what they're doing to the next level. That's helpful. Thank you. So it sounds like you're you're really good at like leveraging technologies just to make businesses more intelligent, just be able to um, make smarter decisions and then obviously um, prevent, predict, will just be more efficient with their time, right? Just being able to look for anomalies, like you said, through the example you gave with the number, like using Gen AI to be able to, to proactively look at anomalies. Um, and you also, um, I know that you and I were, were talk, working on um, potentially helping a bunch of accounting firms with supporting their manufacturing clients as well, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. And so, I mean, for accounting firms, it's uh, the, the way I, I'm looking at it and, and through our discussion, there's really four different angles you know, that, that could uh, you could use analytics for. The first is, is just becoming better advisors. Um, so assisting you know, your, your different industry clients, such as your, your manufacturing clients, such as uh, your other uh, your financial advisors, et cetera, um, just be basically giving them more access to reporting capabilities. Uh, the other is, you know, to, to help augment and to um, automate some of the audit functionalities within the business. Um, so auditing as a whole, and this doesn't apply to just accounting and auditing firms. This applies to any business is um, there's, 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 periodic checks that should happen within business processes in order to control and mitigate risk, right? Um, such as the AP activity of a business, um, you know, the procure to pay activity of a business. And so anytime that you go to submit a payment proposal, you want to validate some of those records within it. Uh, traditionally, a lot of times your businesses are spending manual hours to, to validate those pay- payment proposals in the sense that they're going through and making sure that there hasn't been a change to their um, you know, the routing information, there hasn't been a change to their bank account number. Um, one co- common you know, use case in the U.S. is making sure there's a W-9 involved with that organization before you're actually going and, and, and making a payment. Um, and so there's, there's a lot of validation and checks that go in very commonly within the procure-to-pay business side of the business. Um, and through data analytics and, and auditing methodologies, you could you could really streamline a lot of that and a lot of the validation by putting in automated checks. So you could automatically check revision history of the, the financial information of a supplier to verify that it, it's it's good to go. Or you know, as it relates to the W nine, you could automatically check the um, you know, the cloud folder in which you're st- storing all your 1099s to make sure that supplier that you're making a payment proposal for already has that W9 within the system. Hmm. Yeah, and I know one of the use cases that you're very familiar with is how we're helping um, the expense reduction, was it the ERA thing? Uh, can you share a little bit more about that use case and how we're able to, to, to help them with the automation? Yeah, 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 absolutely. Um, so, you know, it, in some cases, it requires the use of multi, a multitude of different technologies. And so um, in this case, uh, we, we're looking at uh, spend management as a whole uh, and making sure that um, we can automate the looking at what the baseline spend is compared to um, you know, what the spend is after you initiate what the baseline spend is. And so we're actually looking at invoice files that come in to a shared mailbox, and we're using you know RPA technology to to extract the information 
of, of the invoices um, and, and store that within a centralized database uh, in which we you know, were able to like compare that to the baseline spend. And so this just goes into, um, you know, being able to leverage multiple technologies within an engagement. So in this particular use case, we're actually using, you know, RPA technology, which is another uh, common service that we have at Valenta uh, to automate the front end of our analytic act activity. Um, but another very common use case of RPA is using analytics to update systems. And so, um, you know, this is getting into, okay, you know, here's a very common use case is, is let's just say our, we want to use predictive analytics to manage our inventory levels. And so we want to know, and this, this is particularly common where you have like a manufacturer in which they're buying components that has a very long lead time. So let's just say a component's lead time was three months. And, and so you can't, you can't essentially go and, and buy that material um, when it, when it gets low, because you need to, you might need that material the next day or next week, and it's going to take you three months to get that material. And so you need to develop a predictive model to basically say, Hey, I'm expected to run out three months prior to when I actually need that material. And then let's just go ahead and, and place a purchase order. Let's just go ahead and initiate that buying activity. And so you use analytics to, to do predictive analytics to figure out when you need that material. And then you use an RPA bot to go in and actually place the purchase order to communicate to the supplier, uh, get the order on order so that you know that you're going to have material in three months from now, from now so you can begin that job so that you can produce that material in time for that customer demand. Hmm. So, and th this, like to your original point, this only works if you have clean data, right? So, Correct. So what do you do if you're an organization that doesn't have clean data? And um, how do you how do you go about that whole data cleansing process? Yeah, so it's 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 uh yeah, I I recommend just to start by actually putting some AI solutions on top of it, right? So I actually recommend to start by by leveraging you know tools out there such as Databricks um, and and others and even Data Mosaic. Um, to to go in and sit on top of all your 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 databases and your data sets um, to use some AI logic to determine on unvalidated or, or data quality issues. Uh, and that, that's I always recommend that to use that as a starting point because you know developing a data model to to build clean data data underneath is, it's quite extensive and quite elaborate. So it might as well leverage and maximize the use of, of the technologies and tools out there in the marketplace to begin the journey. Um, and then from there, um, you know, I recommend just attacking it one, one sector at a time, one module at a time. Um, and so you come up with um, validation rules. And, and the key here is to, to create validation rules with the end users of those data points. And so you, you can't necessarily interact with just IT and, and the data team to say, hey, um, we believe that these data points and these data rules are, you know, what is driving this data. No, my recommendation is to go to the end user, the, the person who's actually keying in that data to understand how they're keying in the data and why they're doing it in, in that particular manner. Um, additionally, you know, reference any SOPs that exist um, to get that data within the system. Um, so a lot of it is referencing SOPs, um, you know, interviewing and, and reviewing with, with the core users that are inputting the data, um, uh, and then leveraging, you know, the advanced technologies out there on the marketplace and, and building out your own validation rules. And so, um, you know, with these advanced technologies, such as Databricks, you could actually build in validation rules directly on that software, and then they create alerts within the system. So anytime that there's there's an exception to a validation rule, then it'll alert you. You can set up email subscriptions to you know go to the the, the main core users of the business. And so you know, let's just say that uh, an inside sales representative went into the CRM and they keyed in a data point that didn't match how it's supposed to key it in. And so you could you can you know set up an alert that will email the sales manager so that they can communicate accordingly to the inside sales representative and and take it from there. 
Yeah, so it sounds like this is um, also connects to the data governance that you speak of, right? Like being thoughtful about that um, and just thinking about it like holistically, like thinking about it earlier on in the process instead of like when it's too late, when the data is such a mess that it's it's going to be a lot of work to to fix everything, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, it, yeah, it, it definitely helps to to do this up front because no one really likes to rework. Um, but you know, if you get into a situation in which you 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 find the need to to clean the data and to, to revalidate the data, um, it's it's certainly manageable. You just have to tap it in different segments. Um, you know, a, a very typical time in which this happens is through migration, software migrations. Um, and so um, that, that's that's always kind of like a, a give or take, right? Because if you do data validation and data cleaning during the migration, then that's going to extend the timeline to actually migrate the software. Um, but it also is like an opportunity to to really validate and clean, clean it before you get, you put it into the new software. So you're starting at a, a very you know, organized, structured um, manner, right? Um, and so we actually, you know, have tools and systems um, that help with that that process, that data migration process, while simultaneously validating and controlling the data that goes into the new software. That's that's helpful. So, how should like smaller organizations to mid sized organizations be, be thinking about? Hey, does it make sense for me to hire like a full time? data analyst or when should I know to leverage a consulting partner? Like how do I go about thinking about the pros and cons and and um you know leveraging a different partner versus building everything in-house? Yeah, no, that, that's a fantastic question. Um so the the value of working with you know if, if a, a consulting firm, you know, like Valenta, um, is that um you get access to different resources over the duration of the data journey. And so in the beginning of the data journey, you, you want someone in more of a business analyst role that or a system architect role where they're understanding, you know, what, what systems and, and what processes need to be developed from an analytical perspective. Um, and then it transitioned into the data engineer, which is, the one that's responsible for building the data pipeline. So once you identify the key fields and systems that you need to be pulling from, you need to have a data engineer with you to develop the framework in order to e extract that data in real time, then get it into a centralized data warehouse. And then it transitions to the data analyst that's working with the data into in that data model, in that data warehouse uh, to, to, to make sure it's all connected and then to start producing the visualizations. Last but not least is the data scientist that is looking at existing data models and figuring out what, what machine learning capabilities and models can be placed on top of that so you can get to predictive analytics. And so, you know, when, when, when you're thinking about, you know, what's required and or thinking about building out a team, just know that you know, all four of those positions are uniquely different and they have a unique set of skill sets that's going to allow them to to do an effective job and so um it, it could get quite costly you know if you're looking to build out your own internal data team because you know it, it does require all four of those those type of positions and that skill sets uh to really do analytics and that so what i'm hearing is if you hire let's say you only have budget for like one person it's going to be virtually impossible to find someone that is well suited to fill those four different stages of making this work right in terms of uh, like you said the analyst the scientist the engineer and the architect all have somewhat different skills and require different specializations and it's going to be rare to find one person or even two people that can like really do the job well across the whole journey of, of that right yeah oh, and not 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 only that it's, it's going to be rare but um you know it's also you know, also managing tasks, right? And, and you know, a lot of times, you know, you have different resources working simultaneously on different tasks. Hmm. Um, and so you have your data analyst that are, that's fine tuning the visualizations, building them out while the data scientist is, is working to build that predictive analytic engine underneath. 
Um, and so depending on how fast you want to go in terms of your data analytic journey, this is certainly something to consider in terms of uh, going with Valente and the managed analytic route, or maybe finding a, a jack of all the trades resource um, and then you know having it be a little bit of a slower development period. Mm. That's helpful. Mm. Cool. Well, yeah, I mean, we run over a lot of things today, uh, Nathan. Um, so this this is helpful. Um, any last minute words or anything, any trends you're noticing in the um in the data integration in the data visualization space? Yeah, I mean the the, the biggest trend is just AI, right? Um, you know, AI is is a buzzword in, in, in a lot of a lot of capacities um, for organization actually applying it. Um, but you know, for data analytics, it's very practical. Uh, so AI is very practical and it's very real for, for data analytics. Um, and my recommendation is is to you know, get started with with using AI in your data analytic journey um, as soon as possible. Because if you don't, then you're going to fall behind. Hmm. Yeah, and don't be afraid to um, you know, you, there's so many tools out there now, whether it's Gemini or Perplexity or ChatGPT, right? Just to even just experiment so that you can become more familiar. But uh, but at the org organizational level, right? It's um, companies that are going to leverage it early on the early adopters as you mentioned could potentially you know increase efficiencies all around right so it's it's being proactive about it it's, instead of being reactive and eventually it's like okay um we're kind of falling behind and our competitors might be using it to their advantage and we'll have a competitive intel because of that right right right, right. absolutely yeah i mean at the end of the day um, your data data is power, but it's only as good as you know the results, right? And and how it's being interpreted, and and J AI, AI uh, is giving you the power to interpret data in avenues and ways that you 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 may not know and that you you may not be aware of, and so you know, that's really the the power of of AI is it's, it's giving you access to new information that you may not be aware of in instantaneous in a couple of seconds. Yeah. It's pretty, pretty exciting time to be in this field. Um, well, thank you, Nathan. I appreciate all the, the work that you do for, for all of the clients at Valenta and all the clients that work that are coming and just really the thoughtfulness and bringing and building out the data analytics practice. And um, yeah, it's, it's clear that you love uh, learning about new technologies and just love share being able to integrate and being able to leverage it to create better business outcomes, you know, through your experience and, and serving your clients. So I just, yeah, I just want to say thank you for all the amazing work that you're doing. Yeah, no, really appreciate it. And uh, yeah, thanks for having me on and hosting this session. Uh, it's been very valuable and uh, look forward to our, all of our continued conversations pertaining to analytics and more. Oh, yeah. And what's the best way that folks can get in touch with you? Uh, yeah, you can just reach out to my email, uh, nathan.morris uh, at valenta.io, or just uh, connect via LinkedIn. Awesome. Thanks for joining, everyone. Have a good day. Okay.